These brightly colored pansies and violas can remind me of only one thing, and that spring is just around the corner. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Join me next. I'm Alan Smith. One of the most enjoyable aspects of gardening is throughout the growing season there's so much beauty and diversity. In today's show we're going to take a look at using pansies and violas with lettuce. And we're going to move to the end of the season and talk about sunflowers and how to create a beautiful arrangement. Plus butterflies are beginning to make their way from their winter homes and there's one town that celebrates this colorful species like no other. We'll travel to Butterfly Town USA where butterflies are more than just beautiful insects, they're heroes. And if you want to keep aphids on the run in your garden, these little gals are perfect for the job. And last but not least, I've got a savory, low-fat spinach salad recipe with a delicious balsamic vinegar dressing to go with it. It's not only tasty, but it's good for you as well. It's a combination that's not so easy to come by these days. Now let's begin our journey in Butterfly Town, USA where butterflies are around every corner, even walking the streets. We'll pay a visit right after the break, so don't go away. Butterfly, butterfly, flutter by, flutter by. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Butterfly, <laughs> flutter by. <laughs> Sometimes it works. In addition to educating children about the life cycle of butterflies, Rova Caro of Pacific Grove, California, has fought the good fight to preserve an important part of the monarch butterfly's habitat. Can I really fly? Last time I remember, I was a little caterpillar. I'm going to have to check these out and do a test flight and see if I can fly. And it tests them out and it says, I can, I can. I'm not a caterpillar anymore. Now I'm a butterfly. I'm going to go fly, find a purple flower and drink the nectar because I can fly. Okay. So that's how a brand new butterfly is born. You're welcome. They particularly like eucalyptus trees, and in California, that's what most of the habitats are made of. What happened is in November of 1990, we suddenly realized that the property owner who owned these trees at the time had a subdivision approval to cut down all of the butterfly trees and build condominiums in here, and we couldn't let that happen. Friends of the Monarch spearheaded a campaign to put a ballot argument uh, in front of the people for a tax measure to buy the property for the city and turned it into a city park. And we were so proud of the people of Pacific Grove. 69% of them said, yes, go ahead. Wonderful. Tax me, we've got to save the butterflies. We take butterflies very seriously here. This is Butterfly Town USA, and we've had a city ordinance on our books since 1938 that there's a thousand dollar fine for molesting a butterfly in any way. Monarch butterflies, any kind of butterfly, is a, a symbol of hope, renewal, rebirth, resurrection, and uh, like rainbows, it, it's one of those hopeful symbols that uh, just the thought of them makes you smile, the sight of them makes you glow. We can't do without them. No. I've had some wonderful questions from little kids. Probably my favorite, favorite question came from a little, little boy about six years old. I'd answered everything I could answer for everybody, and I said, any other questions? And he said, what are they thinking up there? That's a great question coming from that little guy. 
Now here's an insect that certainly is intriguing and inspires curiosity. It's the ladybug. Now what can these little gals do for us in the garden? Each spring when my garden is full of glorious bloom, it's a reminder to me of the bounty of nature. It also reminds me that it's time to start dealing with pests. I'm always looking for earth-friendly approaches to dealing with problems in the garden. When it comes to insects, one of my favorite philosophies is to fight fire with fire, so to speak, pitting good bugs against bad bugs. Let me give you an example. This is a whole platoon of ladybugs. These little gals are considered beneficial insects for what they can do for us in the garden. You see, they've developed quite a reputation over the years as having quite an appetite for aphids. But ladybugs just don't stop here. They also enjoy eating scale, mealybugs, as well as mites. I know it's hard to believe, but there's an army of over 1,500 ladybugs in this container. Now, I won't release all of them today. I'll wait a few days before I send in the second wave. Soon, these adult ladybugs will lay eggs and larvae will hatch. Now, the larvae look like tiny black alligators with orange spots. It's important to identify them. The main thing to remember when using beneficial insects in your garden is to not use pesticides. You see, the pesticides will kill the bad bugs as well as the good ones. Now, let's take a look at another one of summer's delights, the beautiful sunflower. I'll share some planting and arranging tips when we come back, so don't go away. Now here's a charming flower that can brighten any sunny garden. Is it any wonder why they call these sunflowers? Few names are as fitting. The bloom actually looks like a little miniature sun. And as you might guess, for these little guys to perform well, they need full hot sun. You can't get much more American than these. They're natives that have been hybridized into some astonishing giants. Some of them can produce flower heads at least 12 inches across. And then there are others that perhaps don't grow as large but make up for it with a beautiful array of colors. In the past, I've planted the big guys, but since my vegetable garden is small, they tend to overpower it. So this year, I planted this little dwarf variety called Sunspot. The scale of them seems to fit better. And when you mass them in a raised bed like I've done here, they can be quite a splash of color. I planted these from seed about six to eight weeks ago. I just planted four rows of them, spacing the seed a couple of inches apart. These are some of the showiest annuals you can grow, and since they're up and blooming so quickly, it's a good way to get children excited about gardening. And when the seed heads dry, they're a favorite of birds. I'm cutting a few of these blooms before they get too mature, so I can dry them. There's really nothing to it. Just cut as long a stem as you can and hang them upside down in a dry, well-ventilated place. They're ideal for using for fall arrangements. I thought they'd be nice combined with other things to make a handsome door arrangement. As a base, I'm just using some plumes of wild grasses, and I'm layering the bundles of sunflowers on them. Next, I add the seed heads of some purple coneflower, a little crab apple, and some dried blackberry lily, but many things will work. Now I just bind the ends with pipe cleaners, cut the stems to make them even, and tie it off with a raffia bow. Now after the fall season has passed, I can hang this in a tree for the birds to enjoy. They'll love all the berries and seeds. Now this is a flower you can utilize in three ways. Fresh in summer, dried in the autumn, and as a source for food for wildlife in the winter. Up next, we'll look at some of my favorite spring bulbs and even munch on a few of them while we're at it. Don't go away. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome back. In today's show, we've certainly been flying around. We visited the central coast of California and took a look at monarch butterflies. Aren't they amazing? Hey, did you know that the monarch butterfly is sometimes called the milkweed butterfly? In fact, milkweed is the only food the young monarch larva can eat. But if you'd like to attract monarch butterflies to your garden, you can try planting flowers that the adults love to feed on such as certain species of helianthus or sunflower, mint, salvia, thistle, and several others. 
We've also seen the useful role that ladybugs can play in the garden. I like to release some in the spring to help fight against mealybugs and those insidious aphids. While butterflies and ladybugs are certainly colorful creatures, it's the plants that really grab the attention of visitors to my garden. One of my favorite times to have visitors is the spring. It's a chance to see all of the hard work that I put into the planning of my garden last fall and when I laid out and planted all of those tulips and daffodil bulbs. Here's a tip when planting bulbs. I like to overplant them with pansies and violas in complementary colors. Overplanting bulbs allows them to emerge through the foliage and blooms. For instance, I really enjoy using violas in my garden. If planted in the early fall, they can be enjoyed until freezing temperatures take the blooms away. But once the weather begins to warm, they'll be back in the spring and serve as a carpet of color, accenting the flowers of the bulbs. Many flowers such as these are actually quite at home in a vegetable garden because the blooms are actually edible. Now in the early summer garden, it's not unusual for me to mix in a few nasturtiums. You see, these flowers have a subtle pepper flavor. They're great for adding color and zip to any salad. Now just because you can eat a flower doesn't necessarily mean it's always going to taste good. The large blossoms of squash, for instance, don't have much flavor. But many chefs stuff the blooms with other vegetables and cheese for a tasty side dish that's certainly out of the ordinary. Not all edible flowers have to be related to a fruit or vegetable we commonly eat. Roses, for example, produce a hip or a fruit late in the fall that's rarely eaten. But the flowers and petals are often used by chefs in salads to garnish a dish or even coated with sugar to decorate cakes. Which is also how I use pansies and violas in the spring. I plant a few extra violas and pansies to pick from the garden for use in the kitchen. Other common garden flowers we can eat include daylilies, as well as the blooms of geraniums. As you might expect, many herbs produce edible flowers as well, like this borage. Its tiny sky blue flowers are often used in salads. Lavender also provides a flower we can eat. Now, if you decide to try some of these, it's important to know just exactly what you're eating and that it's safe and make sure that no pesticides have been used on any of the flowers you harvest. Because I like to walk through my garden and graze, if you will, on what's growing there, I always take an organic approach to my vegetable garden. There I can sample fruits and vegetables without worrying about what chemicals have been sprayed on them. Now another vegetable I really like to grow is spinach. It's a beautiful plant in the garden and delicious on the table. So when we come back, I'll share a wonderful spinach salad recipe and teach you how to make your own vinaigrette. That's next, so don't go away. We all know that maintaining a diet of fresh vegetables is one of the keys to good health. During the fall and winter, it's a little more of a challenge to include foods like these leafy greens in our diet. But, you know, it really makes a lot of sense when you consider they're so full of nutrient and folic acid. Baby mixed greens like these have become popular for salads because they're easy to prepare and they're loaded with flavor. Here on this farm, they grow them organically from March until November. Mark Marino, farm manager, oversees the production of these mixed greens. The baby mixed greens are so popular these days because the public really has a chance to get a quality, fresh, organic product that's readily available. And uh, we've put a lot of work into um, their presentation and growth here at Earthbound Farms to make sure that they receive a really clean product that has been grown with a lot of care and precision that also looks good and tastes good. The, uh, the fact that we do cut them by hand ensures that there won't be any machine damaging to the young tender leaves and thus when the consumer receives their product it'll look like it just came from the field, which it did. Having these delicious salad mixes available to us through the cold months makes getting enough leafy vegetables in our diet that much easier. When many of us think of eating healthier, we tend to think of reducing calories and fat. But there are also more serious issues to consider. For instance, many experts are telling us that we're not getting enough calcium in our diets. You see, calcium helps in the fight against bone disease, such as osteoporosis. Surprisingly, spinach is one of the vegetables highest in calcium. 
244 milligrams per cup. Now this really didn't mean a lot to me until I compared it to milk, which has 300 milligrams per cup. So you can see they're very close. Another good reason to eat spinach is that it's loaded with iron. I like using spinach fresh in salads, along with some fresh fruit. I start by rinsing and removing the stems of two bundles of spinach. And to this I add a couple of fresh pears or oranges thinly sliced. And to keep the pears from turning brown, I squeeze a touch of lemon juice over them. To the pears, I'm adding some thinly sliced rings of red onion. And to give this salad some extra crunch, I've toasted about a cup of walnuts on a baking sheet. Now it only takes about 15 minutes in the oven at 300 degrees. Now I've used walnuts, but you could use pecans or almonds. For me, the dressing is the finishing touch on any salad. One that I often use that complements the flavor of the spinach and the sweetness of the pears is a basic vinaigrette using balsamic vinegar. To about a fourth of a cup of the vinegar, I add the same amount of honey and about one third of a cup of extra virgin olive oil. And I always add a little water. About a fourth of a cup is all you need. Now for a little spice. I like to use about two cloves of crushed fresh garlic one teaspoon of lemon pepper, and about a half a teaspoon of salt. Then I just stir the mixture until it's well blended. There's just something about the chemistry of the honey and the balsamic vinegar. When they come together, they're the perfect accent for this salad. Now I'll wait to add the dressing until I'm ready to serve the salad, and then I'll just toss it all together. As you can see, I'm putting the finishing touches on this container. Well, I guess you could call it a salad bowl because everything in it is edible. I'm using two varieties of leaf lettuce, this bronze leafed one here on the front and across the back, this beautiful chartreuse colored lettuce. I'm also using some pansies and this marvelous penny viola. Now what's great about this is it'll make a beautiful presentation in the garden and like I said, everything in it is edible. Now in today's show, we've seen how ladybugs can help keep pests on the run in the garden. Now if you'd like more information on anything you've seen in today's show, or a source on how to order ladybugs, just check out my website. That's pallensmith.com. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile oh. But smile